Who's the new guy? I'm a pretty sure that's the gecko. Wait, did you say Geico? No, the gecko. Well, then why does his lane say Geico? He probably wants the people to know that with Geico, 15 minutes could save them 15% or more on car insurance. Wait, so this is some sort of sponsorship thing? Yes, he's here to let people know that Geico has been saving people money for over 85 years. You mean he came here all the way to the Olympics to let people know about Geico's award-winning mobile app and amazing 24-7 customer service? We are not actually at the Olympics. We're in a video. Wait, we're not at the Olympics? What video? Yes, uh, haven't you seen the camera? Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the show that goes for the gold, but usually winds up with a respectable bronze. Summer is upon us, the world is opening up again, and I feel like we're finally catching up on all the things that we didn't get to do last year. Going to see movies in theaters, attending live music events, and, uh, oh yeah, finally getting hyped for a little thing called the Summer Olympics. Now, while the old sports ball isn't usually part of my brand, Mario and Sonic absolutely are, and I feel like I'm long overdue to talk about Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. The game series that kind of feels like it should have been a bigger deal than it was? I mean, you've got two of gaming's biggest icons facing off against each other, harkening back to the days when there was a genuine rivalry between the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo. Why has this crossover never been a bigger deal? Probably because it's happening in a glorified sports minigame crossover. No need for a theory that time, friends. Anyway, considering the number of videos I've done on both Mario and Sonic, it seems like the Olympics would provide a perfect opportunity for a theorist like me to pit the two against each other and see who would really come out on on top in competitions like the 100 meter dash, the javelin throw, and the pole vault. Except, uh, there's a reason I haven't done a proper Mario vs. Sonic Theory video in 10 years, and that's because, <laughs> do I even need to say it? The two aren't even remotely close in power level. Mario is an Italian plumber who probably gives, at best, a human performance in any racing event, while Sonic could run an entire marathon in a blink of an eye. That's not even hyperbole. If you take Sonic's cannon speed and calculate how long it would take him to run a 26.2 mile marathon, it would literally be less than the tenth of a second that it takes a human to blink. So already Sonic wins every speed-based event hands down. Admittedly, Mario's no slouch when it comes to raw strength. My buddy Austin already did a video calculating how much raw power it takes for Mario's punches to shatter blocks when he jumps, but he's still vastly outclassed by Sonic in that area because Sonic's acceleration is off the charts. And as longtime followers of the channel know, with great acceleration times mass comes great force, which means that Sonic is also going to win the strength-based contests as well. In short, Mario is a very strong human, but Sonic is a force of nature who runs faster than the speed of light, reaching speeds so fast that he actually warps the fabric of space-time. So despite the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games series existing for the entire 10-year run of the channel, I've kind of willfully ignored the topic for the simple reason that an Olympic face-off didn't seem like it would be an interesting face-off. At least that's what I thought until I started digging around into the history of the Olympics. Because while we all know the big traditional events like running and swimming and gymnastics, the Olympics actually have a history of forgotten and downright wacky events like, no joke, town planning. Step aside, athletes, it's time for the architects to shine. There was also dueling. You heard that right, you could gold medal in the sport of shooting a gun at a human-shaped mannequin. Or other mind-boggling events like solo synchronized swimming. Seriously, solo synchronized swimming. If the point of synchronized swimming is that you have a team of two swimmers who are totally in sync. How do you do synchronized swimming when there's only one person? To which the Olympics response was apparently, uh, the swimmers' movements are synchronized to the music? Anyway, this was a real-life event that appeared in the Olympics three times, from 1984 to 1992. So, equipped with these and a bunch of other silly Olympic events, I finally decided it's time to pit the two of them against each other in a video tribute to the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games franchise. Franchise, the little series that could. Not to see who's the better athlete, but to see who has the best chance at taking home the gold in the Olympics' most forgotten and most bizarre categories. First off, since I teased it, we gotta go back to that solo synchronized swimming. The idea of Sonic swimming at all is probably something that'll get a few eyebrow raises from people, considering his history because Sonic and swimming don't exactly play nice together. Oh sure, he has no problem moving around underwater, which is how we have that iconic anxiety-inducing warning sound to let you know when he's about to run out of oxygen. But 
in these levels, Sonic isn't actually swimming. In these levels, his body just sinks to the bottom, making the underwater levels basically just normal ones with slightly sluggish controls. Sonic, as originally conceived, cannot swim. This came to light in an interview with Yuji Naka, famous as the former head of the Sonic team, who shared the following through a translator, quote, he assumed that hedgehogs can't swim, so that's why he made it that Sonic can't swim. But then recently, he saw a photograph in Germany of a hedgehog swimming, so that isn't quite accurate, end quote. In fact, real hedgehogs are actually great swimmers. According to BBC Earth, a hedgehog can swim as much as two kilometers in a single night. Night, not day, because they're also nocturnal creatures. So, when it comes to the fundamentals, like being able to float to the surface so as not to drown at the bottom of Labyrinth Zone, his swimming skills seem to be lacking. Maybe that's why in the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games series, we see him wearing a life vest for the swimming events. Here he is in the latest game. Zoom in on him poised at the starting position, and you can clearly see that he's wearing a blue life jacket. <laughs> Apparently, he needs to wear one in order to make himself buoyant enough to stay above the surface. <laughs> Good job, game designers. Great attention to detail. Also, just look at Sonic's atrocious swimming technique. He isn't even swimming so much as treading water forward. Compare that to Mario in the same game who swims like a proper freestyle swimmer. In terms of speed, the two are roughly even, for game balance reasons, but when it comes to an event like solo synchronized swimming, where contestants are judged based on form and choreography, something tells me that Sonic's life jacket assisted performance isn't going to be impressing any judges. I'm going to have to give this one to Mario. He's no Michael Phelps, but it's not going to take very much to beat the hedgehog in a life vest. Here's an aquatic Olympic event that Sonic might fare better at. Motorboats, or water motorsports, or power boating, depending on which 1908 newspaper you're reading. Look, this event only happened once, barely a decade after the invention of radio, and apparently they weren't issuing standardized press releases, so the reported naming of the event isn't consistent. What is consistent from the reporting is that this event was a complete and utter disaster. Apparently there were three races, all of which involved racing an eight nautical mile course, and in each race, only a single boat managed to cross the finish line due to strong winds that were disrupting the competition. And I can get winds disrupting, I don't know, a sailing competition, but this was a motorboat event. I guess boat engines that can overcome strong winds are an invention that came later in the 20th century. Unfortunately for the motorboat operators at the 1908 London Olympics. So between Mario and Sonic, I'm gonna have to crown the victor here based on who seems like they have more experience with water motor sports. And I think I have to give this one to Sonic, considering that the only memorable thing about Sonic Rush Adventure for DS was the boating minigames. The game's opening cinematic clearly shows Sonic confidently piloting a motorized watercraft. Mario just doesn't seem to have that kind of experience on the water. When we do see him on a boat, it's usually with someone else ferrying him, like the guy in Super Mario Sunshine who charges you 10 coins for a trip to the airstrip. Sure, Mario might have some experience with rowboating from all those Mario Party minigames, but rowboating and powerboating are very different. All evidence points to Sonic being the more experienced and advantaged competitor when it comes to motorsports on water. When it comes to motorsports on land, though, it's gonna be a different story. Both of these guys have racing games. Of course, Mario has Mario Kart and Sonic with the All-Stars Racing Transformed and more recent Team Sonic Racing games. And yes, this is relevant because land motorsports were featured in the Olympics once in 1900. If you read up on the history of the event, it seems more like an exhibition of each nation's most impressive cars. And remember, this was back in 1900, eight years before Henry Ford introduced the world to the Model T, when simply getting a combustion engine vehicle to move was an impressive feat. Still, have to imagine that if motorsports were part of the Olympics today, they'd be using more contemporary technology. And that means, you know, probably faster than the kart racing that we see in Mario Kart. We know from the Mario Kart games that the most skill-testing competition that his pals engage with use 200cc engines. And that means they ain't going too fast. A 200cc four-stroke engine will hit a max speed of around 75 miles per hour, or 121 kilometers an hour. Well, 200cc two-stroke engines, which have higher power but less fuel efficiency, fare a bit better at around 120 miles an hour, or 193 kilometers an hour. And mind you, this is talking max speed. All of it pales in comparison to most real-world motorsports. Even NASCAR, which features stock car racing, in other words, cars that at least kind of resemble a typical sedan that you or I might drive, has the drivers hitting average speeds of around 165 miles an hour. That's 265 kilometers an hour. And the top, top drivers are averaging out over 200 MPH, or 322 kilometers an hour. In other words, if Mario's behind the wheel and wants to hit the speeds it would take to win a motorsports competition, he's dealing with much higher speeds than he's used to. But would Sonic fare any better behind the wheel? I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say yeah. Unlike Mario, he's not just kart racing, Sonic is actually driving larger vehicles that resemble the form and shape of the stock cars that you'd see in competitions like NASCAR. Bigger vehicle means 
means bigger engine, and bigger engine means higher speed. So automatically, it seems like Sonic has more experience racing with faster cars. Mario is by no means a bad driver, but again, I'm gonna have to give the advantage here to Sonic, putting the blue blur ahead at two to one. But enough about motorsports, be they land or on water, it's time to get back to what the Olympics are really about, physical performance, while still sticking to our prompt about choosing the weirdest ones. Friends, may I introduce you to the uh, sport of club swinging? Nope, that's not an activity for Friday nights when you feel like hitting the town. It's exactly what it sounds like, an event that involves swinging a club around your body. And then what, you might ask? Throwing the club for distance, slamming the club down with as much force as possible? Nope, the entire point is the swinging. The competitors are judged largely based on the style they exhibit while swinging the clubs. Can we please start a petition to bring back club swinging into the modern Olympics? In the internet age, club swinging would be like the top tier sport. It would rank up there with ping pong. Hashtag justice for club swingers. Club swinging apparently was a form of exercise with origins in India, but it wasn't until the Indian club made its way to Europe that it got turned into a competition. Anyway, what I want to know is who would make the better club swinger, Mario or Sonic? Well, we already know that Sonic has what it takes to swing a baseball bat hard and accurately enough to hit a home run, including one in the recent movie that he threw himself from the pitcher's mound, so he's definitely got what it takes to swing a club athletically, but when I watch videos of people swinging clubs around their body, sometimes weighing up to 108 pounds, there's one iconic boss fight that constantly comes to mind, and that is Mario's encounter with Bowser in Super Mario 64. First, he has to pick up Bowser by the tail, an impressive feat on its own considering that King Koopa probably weighs thousands of pounds. Then he has to swing him around by said tail, and then throw him with such accuracy and finesse that Bowser's big behind lands on one of the bombs scattered across the arena. Could Sonic do the same thing if he had to? Probably, but he's not gonna be in as much practice as Mario when it comes to contests of picking up a really heavy thing and swinging it around your body in a precise and specific manner. So I'm gonna have to give this one to the plumber, bringing us back up to two to two. For our final event today and our ultimate tiebreaker, I'm gonna go with potentially the most fatal of all Olympic events, pistol dueling. Yep, the same sport whose lethality I'm reminded of every time I look at a $10 bill and see Alexander Hamilton's face. Though usually when I do that, I'm thinking something more like, wow, this guy doesn't look like Lin-Manuel Miranda at all. Anyway, at the 1906 Olympics, competitors dressed in frock coats counted to 10 and attempted to shoot a human-shaped dummy better than their opponents. Is it just me or is there something really weird about making this a competitive sport? Like, they didn't even try to abstract it by shooting at a bullseye or anything. They actually dressed the dummies up with frock coats to look more like a real person. Knowing what this Olympic sport is based on really amps up the stakes for winning the gold, doesn't it? Anyway, this is one area where I feel like both Mario and Sonic aren't gonna have that much experience. For reasons that might be obvious, Nintendo and Sega have both been reluctant over the years to have their family-friendly mascot characters wield guns. That being said, if you've watched Sonic videos on this channel for long enough, you might know one of my favorite places to turn to for, a uh, unconventional Sonic lore. The Archie comics. Where it should come as no surprise that we see Sonic actually using real firearms. And, while they're certainly not his preferred method of problem solving, when we do see him use them, he seems to be perfectly accurate. One shot always seems to be enough to do the job. Mario, in contrast, has zero firearms experience. Even though, in the original Super Mario Brothers, Mario actually did have a gun in early prototypes. In an interview with Famitsu Magazine, translated by 1UP, Shigeru Miyamoto revealed that, quote, during much of development, the controls were A for shoot bullets, B to dash, and up on the control pad to jump. Obviously, Mario's gun didn't survive the development process and was eventually replaced with the fireballs that we now know and love. Anyway, all of this means that Sonic has way more firearm practice than poor Mario, who's never had the chance to use a gun. At least, that's what I would be saying if it weren't for the fever dream that was 2017's Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle, an XCOM-inspired tactical combat game made by Ubisoft getting its sequel next year. I had to look this thing up just to remind myself that it's a real game that does in fact exist. I still have trouble believing on some level that Nintendo signed off on it because in it, yeah, Mario has himself a gun for an arm. So does this mean that Mario could actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sonic in a shooting competition? I'm gonna say absolutely yes. You see, usually in XCOM style games, which is all about tactically maneuvering characters around a battlefield to execute attacks, the designers work in accuracy stats and the chance to miss shots. Mario plus Rabbids, though, ignored that. Mario will never miss the shots he takes with his arm cannon. Anytime he has direct line of sight to the enemy and there isn't anything blocking the shot, which are the conditions that you'd expect from the Olympic event of dueling, he's right on target. And that's in actual combat when he's surrounded by enemies. 
legs. His accuracy would only get better when he's just standing there as part of an Olympic event, looking straight on at a non-moving target. So yeah, against all odds, Sonic and Mario, despite both being characters that you'd expect to have zero aptitude for guns, actually seem to have incredible aptitude for hitting targets with guns when they need to. Maybe the fact that Sonic has more experience with pistols that resemble what would be used in an actual duel puts him at an advantage, but I don't think there's an easy way to settle this. I know this might sound like the ultimate cop-out, but I really can't call it. Which means that we need to go into extra rounds. More wacky events, more zany forgotten facts about these characters. Our Olympic battle will continue in a couple weeks. Who's gonna take home the gold? Well, it's gonna come down to other strange events like horse dancing, hot air balloons, and town planning. All that and more in a future episode time to the closing ceremonies of the Olympic Games. In the meantime, let me know who you think's gonna win down in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss this episode's finale, and most importantly of all, remember, it's all just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. And thank you, Geico, for sponsoring this episode. I don't know how they'd score in a solo synchronized swimming routine, but I do know that their customer service has a 97% satisfaction rating, which, let me tell you, as someone who's been dealing with a lot of people who are very bad at their jobs recently, is absolutely something to brag about. And I'm not just saying that because it's a bullet point on their brand guideline sheet. I'm actually one of their cases. We unfortunately got into a minor accident last year and had to deal with an auto claim. As you might imagine, accidents are stressful. The process is confusing, you gotta get repairs, all that nonsense. Well, with Geico, I can honestly say that the insurance part was actually the least stressful. I filed the claim through the mobile app, which was very easy to navigate and use. I was guided through the process, put in contact with an approved repair shop that was super nice and easy to deal with, and got a completely fixed car back in no time. All while a Geico rep made sure that I had everything that I needed at every step through the process. Long story short, Geico has been a great partner to me and my family, obviously here on the channel, but more importantly, in my real life outside of these videos for the last decade of my adult life. So if you're ever in need of insurance, auto, home, or more, consider GEICO. Link is down in the description below, and I'll see you all next week.